was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears revealing how precious did that grace appear the hour I first Shall my faith 
side but not by side even when it don't seem right trust the lord believe without a doubt god has promised he show up when his praise is given out so praise the lord the victory's in the shout oh maybe you're up against the wall and you're praying it will fall Remember God's equation for success. We must do just what He says, not one thing more or one thing less. Just trust and obey Him. He will do the rest. Shout by faith and not by sight, even when it don't seem right. Trust the Lord, believe without a doubt. God has promised He show up. When his praise is given out, so praise the Lord, the victory's in the shout. Shout by faith and not by sight, even when it don't seem right. Trust the Lord, believe without a doubt. God has promised he show up when his praise is given out. So praise the Lord, the victory's in the shout. Praise the Lord, the victory's in the shout. In the shout. In the shout. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1, that's a, uh, in the middle, towards the, well, towards the back of the Old Testament. So if you can get to uh, Malachi, the first, the last book in the Old Testament, and go back, uh, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai. Malachi. Hagi, uh, Zechariah Haggai, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all have alarm clocks that go off for the morning? Now, <laughs> an alarm clock does two things. It, uh, it alerts you that it's time for something to happen, and it's also something that's easily ignored. Especially on Monday morning, right? You hit that thing four or five times, especially if it's early in the morning, because you you don't you're tired from the weekend and you don't want to get up. And uh, Haggai is a, a, is a uh, sort of is like an alarm clock to us. It's reminding us that it's time for something. And so, if you have your Bibles, Haggai chapter two. Now, I'm having a little trouble seeing this morning, so I will try to to get all this stuff. And if there's a big name that, that comes across here, we'll just skip it, okay? Haggai hey, yeah, chapter 2, verse number 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to came through the prophet Haggai. Hey, yeah. He says, Speak to Zerubbabel, Barab, Zerubbabel, son of Sheliah, uh, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jozak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, ask them, Who of you is left who saw this house speaking of the temple in its former glory how does it look to you now does it seem like to you that there's uh, like nothing 
be now, but but now, but now be strong, Zebul in his name uh, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of uh, son of Josac, the high priest. Be strong, and all of you, uh, all of you of the land declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the covenant with you uh, when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will have more shake. I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. And, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former, says the Lord Almighty. In all this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty asks, or says. Ask the priest what, it, what the law says. If someone car carries, uh, well, I've read the whole chapter of Haggai, and it's the wrong one. <laughs> Haggai chapter 1. Did I say 2? Yes. Okay. That's why it wasn't making sense. Let's try that again. Y'all give me a replay. Haggai chapter 1. Just go back a chapter. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not come yet to rebuild the Lord's house, the temple. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have you, your fill. Now, look at this verse here out of the NIV. You put, uh, you put clothes on, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Verse 9, you expect it much, but uh, see, it turned out to be little. What uh, you brought home, I blew away. And they ask, God says, why? why did I do that? Declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house which remains in ruins, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and their crops since earth. I call for a drought on the fields and on the mountains and on the grain and the new wine and the, uh, the, the olive oil and everything else the ground is produced and on the people, the livestock and all the labor of your hand. Haggai talks about here in, in um, Haggai chapter 1, not 2, <laughs> Chapter 1, he's talking about the Israelites after 70 years of captivity uh, in Babylonia. They come back home, and they get comfortable in their life. They get comfortable with their way of living. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that, des that describes America today. We're comfortable today. We're comfortable as a people. We're comfortable worrying about our own thing and our own pleasures and our own, uh, our own lives. And Haggai hey, sounded the alarm for everyone to wake up spiritually. And he pointed to the lessons of the past. Haggai hey, pointed the problem in verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, this people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to rebuild. Now remember in the, in the Babylonian captivity, the, uh, the temple was uh, destroyed. And now that the Israelites had come back, they weren't worried about the temple. They weren't worried about God's house. They were worried about their own thing. They were worried about taking care of their own stuff and their own home and their own pleasures of life. And so we want to talk about this morning. If we're going to have a revival, what we talked about last week, what do we have to do in order to right the ship? Now listen, the, the temple didn't just describe a place where we worship. It's not just a building. That's not what it was about. The temple represented the presence of God in the midst of the people. This building that we, we stand here and sit in front of this morning is just a building. But when we gather together as God's people, 
The Bible says where two or three are gathered together, what did he say? I'll be in the midst of us. And so when we gather, we're not worried about the building. We gather to, uh, uh, to receive the presence of God. And so they were just satisfied with having God around them, but not God in the midst of them. And so some things I want to talk to you about this morning. Don't be satisfied with having God just in the area. Don't have, be satisfied with just having God in the vicinity. General means God is just there. There's a, a God general and a God specific. And so many Americans are, are satisfied with having God in general. He's just there. He's just around. We know, we know about Christianity. We know all that stuff. But we really don't want God to be too, too close. We don't really want to sell out our lives to God. We really don't want to give God everything where He's in the midst of us. So don't be satisfied with just having God on the outskirts of your life. You want God in the middle of everything that you're doing. Look at what Haggai says to them uh, about their lives. Look, look at this. I think this is just an amazing verse. Look at verse 5. Look at this again with me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways, to the things you're doing. You have planted much and harvested how much? Little. You eat, but you never have what? Enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put clothes on, but you're not. You earn uh, wages to only put them in a purse with what? Listen, he says you're getting all this stuff, but you're never completely satisfied. I like that last part. He says you're earning wages, and it's like putting wages in a bag. And at, at the bag at the bottom of it's got holes in it. So even as you're filling the bag with your wages, it's just running out the bottom. Having God on the outside of our lives is not enough. Haggai says that. He says, look, you're not ever going to be satisfied with having God just on the outskirts of your life. It's, it's going to be never quite satisfying enough. And we look at the people in America today and all around us, and you see people that are just not satisfied People that have uh, plenty of money, they've got good jobs and nice homes, but inside there's a longing that just can't be filled with anything else. And so they, they, um, they have got God on the, in the general vicinity, and they're probably Christian people, but they've never invited Him to be an actual part of their lives, where He speaks to them and guides them and shows them how to live and shows how, uh, what He can do for them. I'm going to tell you, my friend, at one time in my life, we had God on the outskirts. Oh, we went to church, and we worshiped, and we prayed, and we sang, and we done all those things. But there's so much more of a difference between doing all that and allowing God to have full control of your life where you surrender your will to His. You watch Him move. You watch Him work. You watch Him take care of things and guide you. And your life will turn and be completely different. If you ever, for just a moment, let God have that more than just a piece of your life, but all of it, you're going to see things that you never thought or could imagine that God would be able to do when we allow Him just not on the perimeter, but allow Him to have full control of our heart. And that's what God wants to do. God just doesn't want to be on the vicinity. God wants to be in control of your life. God is either on the outside of our lives or in the middle. Now listen to me. There's a difference between knowing God and experiencing God. And a lot of Christians know God. But I'd be, I'd be there to say that there's a lot of people that's never experienced God. That never have put this word to work in, in their lives and see what God can do. It's a completely different thing when you surrender your life to God. When you put your trust and control in God's hands. You're either just acknowledging God or you're praising God. There's a difference. Number two, your life will indicate whether or not you've returned to God. How do we know we've gotten back to God? How do we know we've returned back to God? Your life is going to show it. And most people today are treating the symptom and, or the problem and not the symptom. Israel's neglect of the temple was an indicator light saying something was wrong. 
They wanted God on the perimeter, but they didn't. They were worried. He said, is it time for you to live in paneled houses? In other words, taking care of your own stuff while the house of the Lord remains in ruins. He said, you've neglected the spiritual thing while taking care of your own thing. And the indicator light was that something was wrong, that they cared so much about their own lives that they didn't care so much about God's desires. You don't just do part of the work, ladies and gentlemen, in Christianity. You've got to turn a full, full uh, 180. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 4 says you must turn from your sins. Zechariah 1, 6 and Luke 15, 17 says you must also turn to the Lord. Your life will indicate. Let me ask you a question. I want you to evaluate this statement. I'm going to read it again. And I want, to, I want you to ask yourself if you fall in this category. You've planted much but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. In other words, no matter what you do, there's, there's never plenty. There's always a shortage. You drink, but you never have your fill. You're not satisfied with life. You put ho uh, clothes on, but you're not warm. And ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a time where I've talked to a lot of Christians who are dissatisfied. What's wrong with this country? Not satisfied living in this country right now because it's different. Who would have ever thought 20 or 30 or 40 years ago that we would live and see what we're seeing today? If some of your parents and grandparents were still alive, they would be amazed and highly disappointed in what this country has become. And not just this country, but what church and spirituality means to this country. How many of y'all grew up in a time where you had a drug problem? You know what I'm talking about? You were drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. Had a drug problem. We don't have time for, for godly things. We're seeking answers everywhere else but where they need to be found. I'm choosing not to participate in the world system any longer. They can be busted and disgusted, but I know my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. They can be upset and mad at everybody, uh, but weeping may endure for the night, but joy is going to come in the morning. I'll, you, I'm, gonna, I'm choosing to get up every day and say, thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you, Lord, that you, I got a roof over my head, shoes on my feet, Thank you, Lord, that you provide it yet again to, to this day. Thank you, Lord, that you are not only with me, but you're in me. You're for me. You're going to guide me. There's a difference. You can be a Christian and not have the presence of God guiding your life. There ought to be a difference between us and the rest of the world. Number three, the problem is often... I'm our priorities. Listen to that again. Often the problem is our, our priorities. We make time for things that matter to us. We make time for things that are important. We make time for things that matter. We make time for our children. We make time for our grandchildren. We make time for things to go to a sporting event or... <clears throat> Or whatever it might be. What's your priorities when it comes to God? Look at Haggai chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. Then the word of the Lord came to the uh, through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while this house remains in ruins? Haggai said you've got your priorities wrong. You're worried about you and you're not worried about the things of God. You're living in comfort and taking care of yourself, but you're not worried about Christianity. We can look at the world and say, man, the world has gone to hell. And the truth of the matter is, it's going that way. But what are we going to do about it? We can sit and complain about all the things that are going wrong with the world today, the rioting and the looting and the foolishness that are going on in the world today. But what are we doing about it? 
You say, preacher, I can't change much. Well, listen, we might not be able to change the world, but we can start right here by putting a priority that we're not going to be part of the problem. We're going to be part of the solution. And the solution is a relationship, a deep relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The solution is living for Him and serving Him and showing the world that there's a difference in between the way the world lives and the way that the believer lives. There's a difference between the kingdom and how it operates and the world structure which is falling apart. While the world and the, and the world system today is falling apart and there's chaos in the world, there is no confusion, there is no problem, there is no structural fall in the kingdom because God is still on His throne. He's in charge of the kingdom. The kingdom operates by faith. And if we'll walk in the kingdom way of doing things, God will bless us beyond what we could ever think or imagine. Amen. Problem is oftentimes our priorities. What's your priorities in life? What comes first? Do we say that we don't have time for God? We don't have time to pray? We don't have time to count our blessings? We don't have time to stop and think and ask God to guide us. But see, what we do as Christians seem like foolishness to the world. I had somebody contact me this week and say, do you ever think things are going to go back to the way they used to be in this country? I said, I don't know. I don't know if it will or not, but I know this much. And I can say this today. While the world is falling apart, there's nothing wrong in the kingdom. God is still on His throne. And you got an option, ladies and gentlemen. You either choose to participate in the chaos that's going on in the world, or you choose to walk according to the kingdom way of, of things of life, and you watch God bless in ways you can't even begin to think or imagine. While there's lack in, in uh, uh, when there's lack in Israel, there was plenty in, in Goshen. When there was, you remember the story of uh, Joseph when there was famine in Israel, there was plenty where he was at. We don't have to operate the way the rest of the world does. I'm not going to wake up every day busted and disgusted and, and, and just looking at the world and say it's never going to get any better. It might not ever get better, but I'm not going to participate in it. I'm going to live according to what this book says me and I'm going to says to me and I'm going to tell you right now. I have, I'll be honest with you, this book has never failed me. Problems often are priorities. We make time for what we, what we, we prioritize. Time is often not taken as much as it's made. We make time for things. I remember the days, I, I'm sure you all do too. When we had, you remember when we had revivals that lasted two weeks? Y'all remember that? Every night. And remember when we had two-week revivals, the church house would be full of people. People coming to hear. Now, people say, well, that's because there wasn't anything else to do back then in the communities. We didn't go to town much, and we didn't, we didn't do all that, so we gathered and all that stuff. Those people made time for the things that were important. Now, today, you try to have a three-day revival and see how well that goes. I tried to do three-day revivals over the years, uh, especially when I was in Mount Sterling. Friday night, uh, hardly anybody would come because it's Friday night. We got paid. We got to go get groceries, and some people got to go out and do things and all that stuff because they make that priority. Not like they couldn't go on Saturday afternoon. Saturday night, we try to have a revival, and maybe just a little bit more would come, but we can't come on Saturday night because, after all, we got other things. We got to go to the drive-in theater. We got to do this and we got to do that. And so we got to the point where we were having one day revivals Sunday morning, Sunday night. It's priorities. We make time for the things that matter to us. If your family's important, you make time for your family. You take vacations, you take time off work, and you go places with them. Unless this year, and I wouldn't advise you going too far from home. The world's crazy, and you'll get, a, you'll get the virus quick. You go somewhere, so just stay at home. We were going to go to Kings Island this year. Have you seen the restrictions at Kings Island? 
they want you to make a reservation to get in there. They want to take your temperature when you get in there. And 90 degrees in July, they want you to spend all day at Kings Island in a mask. Now, can you imagine riding a roller coaster in a mask? Whoop, off it goes. Priorities. A turn to God happens when our schedules change. When we make God a priority, life for us will change. It will get better. Returning to God, uh, we, we will return to God when we make Him our top, our, our top priority. Listen, we don't reposition ourselves. We don't, re, or let me say that again. We don't reposition Him. We reposition us. If you've been watching any of my, my Sunday night and Wednesday night Bible studies online, you've heard me say this. When, when our thinking and the Word come in conflict with each other, 